for 12 years now, John Lennon's song, Imagine, has been played or sung just before the ball drops on New Year's Eve in New York City's Times Square. This fledgling tradition tells us a great deal about what we might call the secular political religion of modernity. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. If you want to understand the source of contemporary hostility to the teaching of Western civilization, I think you can find it right there. And the sentiments behind John Lennon's Imagine motivate and explain our most erudite contemporary scholarship, not just large swaths of popular culture. If you'd like a more sophisticated rendering of the same idea, consider this claim from James Burnham's prophetic 1964 book, Suicide of the West. The principal function of modern liberalism, Burnham says, is to facilitate the dissolution of Western civilization. And this suicide will be rash rationalized, quote, by the light of the principles of liberalism, not as a final defeat, but as a transition to a new and higher order in which mankind as a whole joins a universal civilization that has risen above parochial distinctions, divisions, and discriminations of the past." End quote. Academic history, as currently written and taught, is largely a brief for globalization. The idea is to undermine the public sense of national or civilizational identity. With nothing left to kill or die for, the world will presumably live as one. But while imagining a future without countries may be easy if you try, Leninist historians have the vastly more difficult task of imagining a world in which nations and civilizations have never even existed in the past. Is it possible to simply imagine a nation or even an entire civilization out of existence? Well, that's exactly what deconstructionist historians attempt to do. And from their point of view, it is easy because nations and civilizations were never truly anything other than imaginary to begin with. For deconstructionist historians, every collective boundary line is a flawed human construction, susceptible to debunking and especially deserving of such treatment when it encourages an in-group identity, above all, war, at the expense of a capital O other. Well, over the past few decades, just about every familiar narrative in Western history has been subject to debunking by revisionist historians. But how often are these alleged deconstructions themselves critically examined? Well, today I'm going to talk to you about what may arguably be the granddaddy of all historical deconstructions, the, I, the claim that the idea of Western civilization was itself largely invented during World War I as a way of explaining to American soldiers why they were going to fight in Europe. You may or may not have heard this claim, but a great many historians and academics have. The idea that college courses in Western civilization were actually a late and politically motivated invention played a very significant role in the debate 30 years ago over Stanford University's Western civilization requirement. And of course, the decision to eliminate Stanford's required Western culture course helped to usher in the modern era of multiculturalism at our colleges and universities and greatly accelerated the disappearance of Western civilization courses from American colleges. The scholars most responsible for moving today's K through 12 curriculum away from Western history and toward the idea of global citizenship have also been deeply influenced by the claim that the teaching and even the very idea of Western civilization was actually a form of 20th century war propaganda. The origin of this thesis was a 1982 article 
by a professor of history named Gilbert Allardyce called The Rise and Fall of the Western Civilization Course. There, Allardyce fingered not biblical Israel or Periclean Athens, but the war issues course of the World War I Student Army Training Corps as the actual birthplace of Western civilization. So now you know. <laughs> According to Allardyce, the war issues course taught in America, once steeped in the idea of its own uniqueness, to accept an alternative identity, this one highlighting the liberal democratic traditions we share with Europe. This wartime course, says Allardyce, inspired the spread of mandatory Western civilization classes through, through the nation's college curriculum in the years following World War I. Those courses flourished until the Vietnam War. Expressions were told of the alliance of the North Atlantic nations and their dominant position in the world. In sum, the Allardyce thesis suggests that Western civilization is both a recent invention and a thinly disguised form of neo-imperial war propaganda. For decades, the Allardyce thesis has been elaborated by academic historians, most notably in Lawrence Levine's 1996 book, The Opening of the American Mind, a book widely hailed as the Academy's definitive rebuttal to Alan Bloom's closing of the American Mind. Levine expanded on the Allardyce thesis by tracing the history of the American university from the 18th century on. Levine tells the story of the exclusion of medieval and modern history from the classical Greek and Latin curriculum that dominated America's universities until roughly the 1870s. Even ancient history received little serious attention in the 19th century, says Levine, since mindless drills in Latin grammar and deadening mem memorization exercises were the order of the day. Levine also describes the shift in American thinking from the exceptionalism of the 18th and 19th centuries to the very different 20th century belief in a common Western civilization. So, for example, Levine quotes John Adams warning Thomas Jefferson against importing European professors for his new uh, University of Virginia. And then Levine heights Jeff uh, highlights Le Jefferson's own fears that European immigrants might fail to understand or appreciate America's democratic principles. Making a point tirelessly repeated by multiculturalist historians ever since, Levine concludes, quote, the Western Civ curriculum portrayed by conservative critics of the university in our time as apolitical and of extremely long duration was in fact neither. It was a 20th century phenomenon which had its origins in a wartime government initiative and its heyday lasted scarcely 50 years, end quote. Yet the Allardyce thesis is mistaken and dramatically so. It's time the uh, debunkers were debunked. American colleges and universities have been teaching Western civilization since before the revolution. The very idea of American exceptionalism makes no sense without the idea of Western civilization, and the two have always been intertwined. Yes, there is a relationship between war and Western civilization, but it's far less straightforward than Allardyce suggests. And the stereotype of the mind-deadening 18th and 19th century American college curriculum turns out to be a condescending exaggeration. We are the ones who ought to be learning from our often wiser forebears who we are. All right, now the claim that the idea and the teaching of Western civilization were invented during World War I might sound absurd. It is absurd. Nonetheless, <laughs> it wouldn't have gone unrefuted for so long if it hadn't had at least a superficial plausibility. It's true that the phenomenon of a single required course going by the name of Western civilization grew greatly in popularity after the First World War. So it takes some digging to show that the American college curriculum has always included the teaching of what we can rightly call Western civilization. Part of what's involved here 
is the rediscovery of some great and largely forgotten historical works. And the recovery of these neglected classics not only refutes the Allardyce thesis, it offers us a fascinating and revealing lens on our own time. I'll be recounting this lost history of Western civilization in a report I'll be publishing soon, I hope, for the National Association of Scholars. This afternoon, I'll give you just a taste of what will be captured in far greater detail in that report. It turns out, for example, that Lawrence Levine's account of American higher education in the 18th and 19th centuries is a caricature. It's true that the classical curriculum dominated that era, along with memorization, note-taking, and what were then called recitations, that is, in-class responses to instructors' questions about the assigned readings. Yet until recently, we've missed the importance of what one scholar, uh, all too ignored scholar, has called the, quote, informal curriculum, end quote. 18th century Harvard, for example, was actually a poor provincial university, unable to afford the kind of specialized faculty increasingly common in Enlightenment England and Scotland. Harvard solved this problem by creating an unofficial list, I'm sorry, an official list of library books approved for common use by students. Gradually, memorization and recitation were focused on the mastery of introductory texts during the first two years. Juniors and seniors, in contrast, were increasingly referred by the faculty to library work guided by the so-called common use reading list. Students wrote essays drawing on this approved list of library books, the best of which became orations delivered during graduation. Now, it might seem odd at first, but the most heavily borrowed book from Harvard's library between 1773 and 1776 was A Life of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V by Scottish historian William Robertson. Of course, a biography of a powerful 16th century European monarch is post-classical European history, contra Lawrence Levine. But why should such a seemingly obscure book be so popular? Well, the popularity of Robertson's life of Charles V is explained by its book-length introductory essay, A View of the Progress of Society in Europe, from the subversion of the Roman Empire to the beginning of the 16th century. Although we've forgotten it, Robertson's view of the progress of society in Europe was the most popular history of Western civilization in the late 18th and early 19th century American college curriculum. And in contrast to Lawrence Levine's claim that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were too suspicious of foreign influence to want European history taught at American colleges and universities, Adams was virtually Robertson's greatest advocate in North America, while Jefferson included Robertson's Charles V with its great introductory survey of Western history in uh, the required curriculum of the University of Virginia in 1825. Harvard students in 1775 took more history books out of the library than any other subject, amounting to nearly half of all books borrowed uh, that year. So Harvard's so-called common reading list effectively incorporated post-ancient European history into the curriculum well before the school could afford to hire away specialists in this newly emerging subject from overseas. And with Robertson's view of the progress of society in Europe, the most widely borrowed book, it appears that on the uh, eve of the revolution, Harvard's juniors and seniors were studying Western civilization. In fact, it seems to have been the most popular subject. Meanwhile, John Witherspoon, James Madison's teacher and the president of Princeton, directed students in his moral philosophy course to supplement his lectures by borrowing Robertson and other synthetic accounts of European history and culture, like Adam Ferguson's The History of Civil Society, the first known English language publication to use the newly coined word civilization. So once you understand the significance of the 18th century's informal curriculum, not to mention Thomas Jefferson's own curricular recommendations for the University of Virginia, Lawrence Levine's thesis cannot stand.
William Robertson's brilliant account of the West development in his view of the progress of society in Europe ushered in a kind of modern historical writing uh, we take for granted today, but that was stunningly novel at the time. Robertson mastered the idea of unintended uh, consequences, yet did so in a way that preserved free rational choice as a powerful force in history. Robertson's core theme was the dependence of liberty and civilization on restraint. He attributed Europe's progress to balance of power politics, in which even the most powerful nations forswore the quest for universal empire, that is, for the total defeat of their rivals. And as we're learning from new work on James Madison's unpublished writings, Robertson likely uh, had a significant effect on the development of Madison's vision of competing and balanced factions within a constitutional republic. But the greatest and most influential Western civilization textbook of the 19th century was Francois Guizot's The History of Civilization in Europe. Guizot's modern champion, the political theorist Larry Seidentop, calls this lecture series, quote, the most intelligent general history of Europe ever written, end quote. And although neither Gilbert Allardyce nor Lawrence Levine know it, Guizot's history of civilization in Europe was not only the most widely used college history text in America in the 19th century, it was also read as widely as the most popular novel by the general public. And this during an era in which Americans were supposedly uninterested in anyone's history but their own. To illustrate the false opposition between American exceptionalism and the in and interest in Western history, consider that Guizot's history of civilization in Europe was first injected into the required Harvard curriculum in 1839 by Jared Sparks, Harvard's first professor of history. Yet Sparks was also the main American source for Alexis de Tocqueville's thesis that America's exceptional commitment to liberty grows out of its system of local government. I suppose you could say that Tocqueville's other main source for this idea was Guizot himself, since Tocqueville's experience of listening to Guizot deliver his original lectures on the history of European civilization inspired him to look to America for alternatives to France's centralized bureaucratic state. In those days, America's exceptional taste for liberty was rightly understood as the development of a broader and long-standing European project. Guizot's fundamental thesis is that Europe's civilization grew out of its competing centers of social power, the church, the monarchy, the aristocracy, and the urban middle class. And I guess I'll interject here that we've heard a lot today about separation of church and state. And so you can see that this encompasses, but also goes beyond that. Um, in effect, Guizot extended Robertson's argument about the necessary balance of state power and the dangers of universal empire into the cultural realm. According to Guizot, it was the failure of the theocratic monarchic, aristocratic, or even pure democratic principles to gain unchallenged empire over, over the others that ultimately guaranteed Europe's progress and freedom. And Guizot's idea became central to John Stuart Mill's defense of free speech in On Liberty, whereas early on, Mill had put his faith in what he called a clerisy, a kind of educated, secular, uh, but quasi-religious, elite that could lead social progress. Under the influence of Guizot's vision of liberty, emerg uh, a vision of liberty emerging from competing social centers, Mill changed his mind. Mill eventually came to believe that the greatest threat to freedom would be the complete triumph of either the elite intellectual clerisy or the competing forces of populism not only low forms of populist anger, but also educated and refined elites could threaten freedom with a lust for universal empire, an urge for total control. Mill knew Europe's educated clerisy well because he lived amongst them 
and for his understanding of the populist counterforce to the elite clerisy, Mill looked to the rise of Jacksonianism in America. Well, it seems to me that the last American presidential election makes sense in light of the theme of balanced opposition nurtured by Robertson, refined by Guizot, and uh, channeled by Mill. In 2016, a perceived threat to freedom and self-rule from an entrenched and arrogant elite called forth a populist reaction. With luck, the correlation of forces in society will rebalance as a result. The danger, however, is that in our day, both the elite and the opposing populist forces have lost their feel for liberty and for the self-restraint upon which liberty depends. Once we recover the lost 18th and 19th century history of the teaching of Western civilization, we discover that Americans were not simply taught the principles of liberty explicitly as in a catechism. Instead, these principles were woven deeply into the fabric of the ages through the teaching of Western history. And uh, that story seared liberty into our bones, so to speak, by connecting us to an enduring civilization's heritage. Now, here is the deeper reason why the rising American generation is losing its feel for liberty. Liberty in the bones is lost when the story of the West is forgotten. So to sum up, it turns out that it isn't so easy to imagine the past away. Deconstructionist historians wrongly came to believe that countries and civilizations were simply imaginary human constructions. Once they found a superficially plausible way to dismiss the West as a tissue of invention rooted in militaristic chauvinism, it flattered their intellectual prejudice. As the saying goes, the story was too good to check. And it could have been checked. None of this stuff uh, is all that hard to find. Anyone who really wanted to find this stuff could find it and see that the Allardyce thesis was bogus. Imagining a completely globalized future isn't so easy either. The past does not simply disappear. The weight of civilizations cannot be so easily cast aside. After all, the wish to undo and dissolve competing countries and civilizations is itself a misguided offspring of the characteristically Western quest for equality. In another sense, however, forgetting the West's own heritage of liberty, as John Lennon would have it, isn't hard to do. American historians quite easily forgot their predecessors three decades ago when the Allardyce thesis took off and the Stanford decision went down. And all of this was preface to a broader social forgetting of the Western past, a forgetting not only perpetuated, but even consecrated annually in Times Square. Imagining may be easy, but history takes hard work. So let us then get to work recovering and retelling the story of liberty, the story we've nearly lost. <laughs>